Okay, so thanks for joining these sessions. My name is Prudence Dato and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Basel and this is the joint work with Frank Rizai also from the University of Basel. And this is the paper on how to design optimally the mix of policy instrument to give the right incentive for the green technology transition. So as introductions for uh, this paper, I will start with the important role of green technologies in climate change mitigations, and also as the key solutions of a green growth, because this will contribute to reduce uh, the carbon intensity for our, our production process, and also uh, using uh, less natural resources. So overall, this will contribute to reduce uh, the, uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, so when we are talking about um, transition to green technologies, we have in mind many type of transitions uh, depending on the sector. So for instance, in the mobility sectors, we can uh, highlight uh, the fact that a vehicle are going to replace cars that are based on diesel and gasoline. We can also think about in the electric sectors, uh, clean technologies are going to replace uh, the fossil fuels based uh, electricity generation plants. And this also uh, happened already in the cooling sectors in 1819s, where we saw that there was a phase out of CFC uh, based products. Uh, the problem here is that all this important role can be undermined by the market failures. And one of the big market failure is public goods uh, because of uh, this um, feature of the uh, of innovation. So, but fortunately, there are uh, some policy instruments that can be implemented to solve this problem. So those are, for instance, patents, license, and also uh, innovation subsidies. The second type of market failure that we can see here is externalities. But again, there is environmental policy instruments like environmental tasks that can be implemented to solve this. So we then need to find kind of appropriate combination of all these instruments in order to get uh, the right incentive for the investments in green technologies. So on top of this market failures, what is also important to consider here is that uh, when you think also about green technology transition, this implies that there will be some changes in terms of the market structures and how a firm in this market can behave strategically. So this needs to be considered in how we design uh, the optimal uh, mix of instruments. And one example of this dynamics that we need to consider is uh, the one that is happening now in the EV uh, electric vehicle market. So we can see at the beginning that there is some um, motivation for innovations uh, from Anchorman, but the sale of this um, uh, EV vehicle did not fall at that time. And from the second period, uh, there were less innovations, but that time there is new camera. So Tesla that now becomes uh, a first mover and leader of this market. And final stage, is that some incumbents like General Motors, Toyota, Renault, and Nissan, they are now following these uh, leaders, uh, this new entrant, Tesla, and also increase their innovations and also sales. So this market is not uh, static, so it is dynamic market. As we can see also that some look at them, I can also uh, uh, try to compete uh, with uh, Tesla. This is the example, for instance, for Renault Zoe in Europe. But again, Tesla and other incumbent like General Motors, they are exploring other options uh, to drop the EV price. Uh, one of the options is uh, to have a better battery option, for instance, that can really help to uh, drop the price. Then under these conditions, uh, we uh, wanted to answer some of the research questions, mainly two research questions. The first one is obviously, uh, you know, we have to uh, better in the sense, what are the motivations for a social planner uh, to opt for the green technology transitions, uh, mainly based on the level of damages? And the second main question is, uh, what is the optimal combination of policy instruments in this case uh, that can provide the right incentive uh, to invest in uh, green technologies? And one related question is, obviously, if this optimal combination of instruments depend on the market structures, that's something that we may expect and also on the level of environmental damages. And finally, one of the questions that we have in mind is what is the fiscal implications of these decisions for the regulator? And the combination of answer of these three uh, main questions will provide policy instruments uh, to the regulator in terms of 
how to dynamically uh, design the means of policy in order to support uh, uh, the transitions and development of green technologies. Uh, so when we look at the literature, we can see that there is two strands of literature so, uh, around innovation in environmental economies. So the first one is I already mentioned uh, market failure and some instruments that can be implemented like innovation subsidies, uh, patent and so on. And then in the environmental policy, there is for example, Caribbean task, but this also has some critics uh, basically in imperfectly competitive markets. There are also some studies that use both uh, policies and find that environmental policy instruments is not enough to achieve optimal outcome, meaning that this need to be uh, complemented with uh, other non-environmental policy instruments. So to the best of our knowledge, there is no specific studies that explore these interrelations uh, between market structures and environmental and innovation policies, including the welfare and fiscal implications. Since uh, our um, objective here is to fill this gap. So for the rest of the presentations, I will quickly present you the model first, and then derive how uh, we um, analyze the welfare optimizations. And then the main part will be focusing on the optimal policy instruments. And before the conclusions, uh, we we'll highlight uh, what we find uh, in terms of fiscal uh, implication for the regulator. So let's start with the model. So this is based on previous work that uh, we did, uh, in which we assume that there is two type of technologies. There is one uh, old technologies that is pollutants, and the other one which is new technology that is green, like electric vehicles or renewable energies. The old technologies is going to uh, um, have a negative um, effects on the economies. So we assume that there is a pollution damage here. And for this, we uh, explore two types of policy instruments. There is a task, and this task is tau, and this tau is uh, linked to um, the old technologies uh, that is produced. And we also assume that there is subsidies, innovation subsidies for the new technologies, differently from the increment. The increment is going to get SI as subsidies for the innovations, and the entrance is going to get SN as subsidies for the innovations. So at the moment, note here that there is no assumptions uh, on the uh, policy instrument, meaning that this policy instrument can be positive or negative. So negative tasks. Uh, environment tasks will mean subsidies and negative um, innovation subsidy will mean uh, tasks. So on the demand side, we assume that there is a continuum of consumer uh, having different type of utility regarding the type of technology that is, uh, that is consumed. So uh, in the first equation that you can see here, this is the utility uh, related to on uh, the old technologies, uh, we assume here that one is the quality of uh, the old technologies and PL is the price. And the second equation is the utility are uh, related to uh, the new technologies. And this new technology have a quality, which is K. And we assume that alpha here is the rate at which the new technology can expand the overall uh, demand, meaning this is kind of market share uh, for the new technology. And PS, of course, is the price of the new technology. So on the supply side, we assume that there is um, a constant marginal cost uh, for both income and entrance, but different, so CI for the income and C for the new entrance. So from that, uh, we have, we define the profit for each of the firm. So we have the income having three uh, components for the profit. There is one coming from the old technologies and the second one coming from the new technologies. And the last component is related to the policy instruments. For the new entrants are uh, having two components because the new entrant is not uh, supplying the old technology. So the profit is only coming from the new technologies and the second component is related to uh, the policy instrument, mainly subsidies, because there is uh, no tax on uh, the old technologies uh, for the new entrants. So from this setting, we can have possibility of set uh, seven uh, market structures. So 
that we denote from K0 to K6. So um, briefly what we have in K0 is in the case, um, the incoming is supplying the old technologies and the new technology at this moment is not available. From case one to case three, what uh, we have there is that um, we have in combination to the old technologies, the new technologies. And depending on the market structures, the new technologies can be offered by only incoming or only entrants uh, the market can be shared uh, between the two firms. And lastly, from case four to case six, it's similar to case one to three. The only difference is that uh, the old technology is completely uh, phased out. So um, on <clears throat> that's briefly the model. So from this model, we derive uh, the welfare optimization first by uh, getting the demand that we use in the welfare uh, maximization program, which is basically um, the surplus of the consumer plus uh, that of the firm minus um, the damage. And from this um, welfare optimizations, uh, we then and derive uh, the following propositions. And this following proposition have mainly three uh, components. So I will uh, briefly highlight uh, each of the three components. So uh, the first part of the proposition concerns the transition from only the old technology to only the new technologies. So in this case, uh, what happened is that the transition have two main drivers. So accumulated innovations, market share for the new technology and level of damages. So basically uh, first on one hand, uh, if the accumulated and innovations is not extremely higher than the market share, then no transition will occur for small damages. The transitions is only possible when the level of damages is high enough. On the other hand, what we have here is that if the accumulated innovations is extremely higher than the market share, there will be a transition even for small damages. So basically this is showing that in the economy with small accumulated green innovations, high environmental damages will drive the green transitions as the innovations is not enough to compensate for high damage. In economy with mature green innovations, uh, environmental damages do not play an important role in the green technology transitions. So the second part of this proposition is related to uh, the transition from both the two technologies to only new technologies. So here, the main driver is the level of innovations relatively to the environmental damage. So what we have here is uh, that if the level of innovations is sufficient to cover all the level of damages, then the transitions will occur. Otherwise, when the level of innovations is not sufficient, there will be no uh, innovations. So again, here, the main driver is the level of innovations relatively to the damages. Note that in this market, uh, in this uh, structure here, the market share for the new technology does not play an important role here as the economy already has uh, the two uh, technologies. So there is also um, one additional um, uh, that's component that we look at, which is uh, intermediate uh, transitions uh, from the beginning of old uh, technologies to uh, and the use of the two uh, technologies. So this case, um, we found similar uh, result as in the previous case. Um, the only difference is that um, the main driver in the level of innovations is now relatively to environmental damage and uh, in the market share. So um, overall, what we found here uh, basically is that this proposition is showing that uh, the social desired market structures is not unique, right? Um, so, oh, sorry. so it is not unique. As this depends on the level of innovations, uh, as I said before, market share of the new technologies and level of damages. And this also includes this last uh, component of intermediary phases that enlarge the set of market uh, structures. 
So based on this, um, we analyzed the optimal instrument uh, given the optimal desired market structures. So we compute first the competitive market equilibrium with policy instrument. And then um, we uh, compute the optimal policy instrument in order to implement the first bet that we find with uh, the welfare optimization. So basically uh, what we find uh, here First is that as long as the incoming supply only the old technology, that is when the new technology is not available, or together with the new technology, the optimal task has the same um, expressions and internalize the damages for all the cases. And the level of subsidies also reflects here the accumulated level of, in a level of innovations that affect the decision of transition. But certainly what we find is when the new entrants only uh, supply the new technologies, the optimal task that we find here now depend not only on environmental damages, but also on the innovation from the entrant and the market share. As in this case, the income is losing part of the market that you cannot compensate with the new technology market. The same arguments hold for the optimal subsidies that we have here. So um, given that the entrance will induce loss in the old technology market that cannot be uh, compensated. So given this level of tasks and subsidies, we then derive policy decisions uh, by analyzing the sign of the policy instrument together with the existence condition for uh, each of uh, the cases that we highlighted before. So, can be positive tasks, negative tasks, or uh, uh, positive subsidies, negative subsidies. So uh, this gives us the second uh, um, propositions. In terms of environmental tasks, what we find is that when the old technology is available and the incumbent supplies the new technology, lower damages require a subsidy. This is because there is no sufficient in, uh, motivation for innovations and then financial support is needed to drop the price to the competitive level. Also, task is needed for higher damage because the old technology should be phased out and there is uh, not enough, there is enough motivations uh, for innovations. But things are slightly uh, different. Uh, in the second case, if the entrant has the monopoly on the new technology market, then a task is still needed for higher damages. However, for low damages, a subsidy is required only if the level of innovations of the entrant is sufficiently low. Otherwise, a task will be required if there is uh, sufficient innovations from the entrant. That's for the environmental task. So regarding now the innovation uh, subsidies, what we find is first, uh, when the new technology is available and accept the case in which uh, the two firms share the market of the new technologies and the old technology phase out, subsidies in this case should be provided to the relevant firm, meaning that uh, subsidies to the incumbent, if incumbent is supplying uh, the new technologies, are subsidies to the new entrants if the new entrance is supplying the new technologies. But for the second um, part of the innovation subsidies, again, things are different. Uh, when the, this, the two firms share the market of the new technologies and the old technologies is phased out. So uh, first we find that for lower damage, uh, a subsidy to the income is not feasible, while a negative subsidy to the income is feasible when the innovation of the income is aggressive. And the second case that we find is that uh, for higher level of damage, a positive uh, subject to the income is required when um, the innovations of the income is uh, moderate. That is this case. Uh, a negative subject uh, should be uh, given to the income if its innovations is aggressive. So uh, from this, what we also look at, um, basically this uh, second proposition is highlight the fact that uh, 
We have different set of market structures depending on the level of environmental damage and the level of uh, accumulated um, innovations. Uh, so here, what we would like to highlight uh, as additional um, analysis is look at the fiscal uh, implications because the regulator can also uh, uh, base on the surplus, on the budget surplus or budget deficit uh, to decide on which type of market structure to implement uh, depending on the condition that we had before. So in this case, what we basically find is that uh, when um, the case is related to, so uh, the fiscal implication is the difference between the revenue uh, through the task that is collected minus um, the subsidy that is given to the firm. So this can be uh, a surplus when this is positive or negative uh, if the difference uh, is negative. So depending on uh, the conditions, if it is only task, then this difference um, is going to be positive. If it is only subsidies, this is going to be uh, negative as a deficit or the budget deficit. But in some cases, there is a balance because in some cases, we, as we had it before, there can be the implementation of both instruments like tasks and subsidies. In this case, uh, as the status of this budget will depend on uh, how uh, the effect balance each other. So um, quickly to conclude here, what we basically did is uh, look at optimal mix of policy instruments by analyzing or taking into account the interrelations uh, between market structures and the two type of policy instruments, innovations and environmental policy. We do the welfare comparisons and also look at the policy decisions in terms of tax and subsidies, and also the fiscal implication for different market structures. And basically what we find is that um, the optimal market structure is not kind of single solutions. And depending on the uh, environmental damage and accumulated level of innovations, this can change. And we find that the taxation and subordination policy and their combinations are deferred depending on the market structures and the environmental damages. As policy implications, uh, basically what we suggest is the implementation of both environmental tasks and on the old technologies and innovation subsidies on the new technologies. And these innovation subsidies have to be firm specific uh, uh, policy instruments. And the regulator should not commit to a static combination of these two policy as uh, the market is dynamics and different policy uh, can be implemented depending on the market structure. And lastly, uh, what we could recommend is that the regulator can also use the fiscal implications uh, in addition to social welfare to decide on which market structure to implement uh, depending on the stage and uh, of the green transitions uh, process. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rudence. I think it's quite an original um, approach to optimize according to policies and not according to technologies. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, was very interesting. You've gone a little bit over the time of your presentation. So we have only one minute and 30 seconds for questions. So we have one question from Sahid. Uh, and how does the model incorporate incentives for consumers? And the model does not uh, directly uh, include the incentive for consumers, but this is basically related to the price because uh, the policy instrument that we have implemented here will also affect implicitly the price. And as this affects the price, then uh, this uh, provides also incentive uh, for consumers, depending on the market, um, when green technologies is uh, welfare and proven to uh, to be implemented, then uh, the regulator can use this um, policy instrument to also influence the price. Because at the end, what we also find is uh, that the subsidies and the tasks that we provide also um, affect uh, uh, the price. Okay, uh, I would have I would have one little question before uh, going to NCU's presentation. Uh, what uh, exogenous data do you use in your model? Uh, there is uh, this is it is theoretical model, and we 
uh, calibrate just to highlight uh, in the paper, I did not present this here. We use some graph uh, to show for illustrations, but we don't use uh, any data. This is only theoretical. Okay, okay. Yeah. But as a follow-up, we are planning to use um, innovation data, so pattern data or other things that we are exploring to provide uh, empirical uh, uh, analysis that will be kind of um, uh, to test what uh, the main result that we have here so far. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, MCU, can you share your screen? Yeah, um, I'll try to share my screen. Um, I think it's on now, so you should yes, be able to see yes, my screen. See. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Lucas. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, I am Yang Sui, a fourth year PhD student from the University of Oxford. And the work I'm going to present is joint work with my colleagues from Oxford and also University of Barcelona. So, in this paper, we are going to look at the role of plant conversions and abatement technologies um, in addressing the asset stranding in the power sector. So firstly, I'll start the presentation with the motivation. So here I show the um, distribution of the global coal power plants in 2020, and we see that Despite the very stringency um, climate constraints, there are still a lot of coal power plants that are being built and also being planned uh, in 2020. Um, and then we have heard the warnings from climate scientists saying that um, the emissions from these existing fossil fuel power plants may already go beyond the carbon budgets that are consistent with the Paris Agreement. Um, so which means if we are to attain these targets, then some of these power plants will not be able to be operated, um, to be operated as they are expected to. So this signals the issue of stranded assets, which are defined as the um, fossil fuel assets that may suffer from premature write downs, devaluations, or conversion to liabilities. So, there's a large literature behind the stranded assets. Um, and what we did here in this paper um, is we went one step um, further. Uh, we realized there is the stranded assets issue. Then we try to look for um, solutions to this problem. And particularly, we are looking at the role of technologies here to see whether technologies could help uh, mitigate such risk. Um, so there are also many fossil fuel stakeholders that they are um, actively investing in these technologies. Um, as we see that the carbon capture and the storage um, is a technology that could prevent emissions from going to the atmosphere um, and bioenergy could absorb CO2. And if we combine these two, the whole process, the BECCS, could actually provide um, negative emissions that may expand the carbon budget and potentially allocate more carbon allocation to fossil fuels. So um, these fossil fuel companies, they are putting their hopes on these technologies and wish that these technologies may um, allow them to continue their fossil fuel business um, in the net zero future. So this is one part of the solution. And then for those power plants that are already operating that are uh, or being constructed, um, the solution for them is they could um, have the plant conversions. Um, so basically, there are two ways of plant conversions. One is through fuel switching, 
uh, we could um, convert the more carbon intensive um, coal power plants to use less carbon intensive fuel like gas and biomass. And for both um, approaches, there have been successful um, cases in the US, in Europe, and in Canada. At the same time, um, there's also the um, CCS retrofit. So which means uh, for the power plants that currently do not have um, CCS equipped, they could be retrofitted in order to have the CCS re um, equipped with the power plants. And we see, according to a report from the IEA, around 55% of the existing coal fleet in China are suitable for the retrofit. So all of these um, technologies look very promising, um, but to the best of our knowledge, there hasn't been any study that has rigorously analyzed whether plant conversions and abatement technologies could mitigate the acid stranding risk in the power sector. So this is what we are going to address in this paper. Um, and then I'll show you the data and the method we used in this analysis. Um, so firstly, in terms of data, we use two types of data inputs. Um, one is the global power plants data site, which are used to estimate current power plants future production level. And we compiled the global power unit level data from different sources in order to make this data site as comprehensive as possible. And then we also use the climate, um, the climate scenarios. Uh, to model the pathways of electricity production required to attain the two degree target. So for this one, we retrieve the scenarios from Ampere project, which is a modeling comparison project that incorporates uh, results from different IAM models. And the main reason why we use these uh, why we use climate scenarios from this project is because they model different technology availabilities. So as you can see here, um, they have the all technologies fully deployed scenarios. So which means um, these four technologies, CCS, bioenergy, nuclear, wind, and solar, they are fully deployed. And then they also have the single technology change scenarios. So which means um, either one of these technologies is um, not available or is limitedly developed. So by comparing the results um, between these pairwise scenarios, we could quantify the impact of the technology availability on stranded assets. So which I will introduce more in detail in the next slide um, when I talk about um, the method. Um, so here is the overview of our method. Um, the first thing to bear in mind uh, in order to help you better understand our results um, is that we define the stranded assets um, as the lower electricity generation due to climate constraints. So we are measuring it in engineering term in how much electricity could be generated. Um, and we measure it by the difference of electricity generation between existing power plants and climate scenarios. Then we follow a four step method um, for our analysis. So firstly, we compute the future electricity generation from existing power plants by assuming the, these existing power plants will be operating at certain utilization rates until the end of their expected lifetime. And then we estimate the asset stranding for each climate scenario. So by comparing the electricity generation from the existing power plants and the number indicated in climate scenarios. And after that, 
we take plant conversions into account and re-estimate the asset stranding, so which I will talk more in detail in the next slide. Um, and finally, we quantify the impact of technology availability by comparing the previously mentioned, the, tech, the technology pairwise scenarios, um, which means we compare the results in the full technology um, scenario with the single technology changed scenarios. So these are the overview of the method. Um, and then I will show you in more detail on the plan conversion assumptions we have made. Um, so basically what we did here is we um, firstly identify which power plants are suitable for conversion. And then we assume a reasonable percentage of these plants that are likely to be converted. Um, so for code to gas, we focus on um, having access to gas. Um, and then for code to biomass, we do not have any individual um, specific parameter on the plant suitability, as we assume all coal-fired units could use biomass um, at certain biomass co-firing ratio. So the ratio could be as low as 5% or as high as 100%. We do not have any restriction on the individual plant level, um, but we do have some constraint on the aggregate level um, as a whole. Then for CCS, we do have some um, criteria on the plant's capacity, age, emission level, and also location. Um, then in terms of conversion percentage, so we assume two levels. The first level is a, is a more conservative level, so which is currently available, and um, it is more likely to happen. And then we also assume a more optimistic level, um, which is technically achievable, but we know uh, due to a lot of constraint, this might be less likely to happen. So, um, I'm, so we are particularly uh, looking for any feedback on these plan conversions. If you have any comments here, um, I would be really looking forward to, uh, to hearing your feedback during the QA session. So these are um, the overview of, of our methods. And then I'll show you the results um, of our analysis. So firstly, here uh, is the first result on the estimates of future electricity generation. So we find in total from this year till the end of the century, there will be around 540 petawatt hour of electricity that could be produced from current existing fossil fuel power plants. And then we break it down by fuel and also by region, as you see here, and we find about uh, two thirds um, of the fossil fuel electricity are supplied by coal power plants. Um, and in Asia, there will be more than 60% of the fossil fuel supplied electricity. Um, then we also show one example of the climate scenarios we used in our analysis here, uh, represented by the dashed line here. So you see, if we only look at the electricity generation from the operating power plants, so which are here the darker colors, then it's roughly within the boundary of the climate scenario. However, when we add on the electricity generation from the pipeline power plants, then it goes beyond the boundary of the climate scenario. So which signals the issue of um, asset stranding. And in order to understand how much asset stranding there is, um, we show the results in figure two. So which are our estimated stranded assets in the two degree or technologies deployed scenarios. 
uh, firstly, we show um, the global level. So it is at 270 petawatt hour of electricity, that risk of stranding. And then we break it down by region. And we see more than 50% of them are located in Asia. And in the two Asian countries, so China and India, uh, they have um, around 140 petawatt hour of uh, electricity that risk of stranding. So here the bars show the average value um, across different IM models um, and the uh, individual models um, results are represented by the scatters here. Um, and then we also split the electric the stranding assets by operating plants and pipeline plants. And we see that there is much more coming from pipeline than operating. So which signals that we could mitigate the risk of asset stranding by just stopping the construction of these um, pipeline power plants. So then we look at the impact of plant conversions. Um, so here what we show is um, if we assume a certain percentage of the power plants to be converted, then what is the change of stranded assets compared to the baseline? So which is, I just showed um, there's no conversion. Um, and then the baseline value is 270. So we see here, um, the first bar is representing the more conservative um, percentage of conversion. And the second bar in each figure is showing the more optimistic level of conversion. So we see among these three options, CCS conversion have the most potential as if we assume all of these CCS suitable units um, could be converted, then it's um, it, then it could reduce asset stranding by around 50 um, petawatt hour of electricity. Um, then the both options of fuel switching um, have the potential to reduce asset stranding by 35 um, petawatt hour ish. Um, but all of these options have very limited impact as they could not reduce asset stranding um, to, to zero or to a very significant amount. So that's what we find on plant conversions. Um, and finally, the result on technology availabilities. So what we show here is um, each bar is representing um, what if this technology is not available, then what is the change on stranded assets compared to the baseline um, scenario, which assumes all technologies are fully deployed. So we see that um, CCS and bioenergy have the most um, significant impact on stranded assets, as if one of them is not available, then the amount of stranded assets would increase by 68 or 44 percent. Then wind and solar, nuclear and energy intensity do not have significant impact on asset stranding. So all of these are our findings. And finally, to conclude, so what we find in this paper is there is very high stranding risk even under optimistic technology assumptions. Um, and we uh, find there are around 270 petawatt hour of electricity risk of stranding. And to give you an idea of how much this is, it's around 10 times the global electricity generation in 2018. So a very huge number. Um, and then plant conversions have very limited impact um, as they could reduce asset stranding from 270 to 220, but still the number remains very high. And then um, stranding may be 68 or 44% even higher if CCS or bioenergy um, are not deployed which we know is very likely to be the case 
as um, both large scale de development of these two technologies are facing a lot of challenges like high cost storage sites availability, feedstock availability, and then also for bioenergy, they have concerns on deforestation and food security, also bio, uh, biodiversity loss. So these are the conclusions. And finally, for the implications, um, so um, to answer the research question, whether abatement technologies and uh, could reduce asset stranding, the answer is yes, they could. But um, so that's why we should still strongly push the development of, of CCS and bioenergy. Um, however, asset stranding risk remains substantial even under um, the fully deployment of these technologies. So that's why stakeholders should act swiftly to minimize the stranding risk. And for existing plants, fuel switching remains as an option, although the impact is limited. Um, and for pipeline plants, uh, there could be very little or even no fossil fuel plants that can be commissioned. So uh, that's all the presentation. And thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to um, hearing your feedback. Thank you, Ying Siu. Thank you very much for the presentation. We have two questions for you. One's from Sahil again. Is any government policy considered in the Munda? And I also wondered if you consider the CO2 tax, for example. Um, yes, so um, so the first question on whether it, um, there's any government policy considered. So um, in all the climate scenarios we used, um, they have um, already considered um, like if we are to attain the two degree target, then how much electricity could be produced from each different type of fossil fuel power plants. So that's like one aspect uh, that we incorporate a little bit the government policy there. And then a second point is the utilization rights um, of the power plants that we used. Uh, the utilization rights extracted from the IEA um, stated policy scenarios. So these scenarios, um, actually they reflect the um, government's policy in today's world. So which means um, if there's any policy that are already implemented now, um, then they are uh, reflected in the utilization rights. However, we do not consider any like future government policy that haven't been um, applied yet. So I think this um, is the same um, answer for uh, Lucas' question on the CO2 tax. So which means like um, if the government has already set a CO2 tax or, or something like that, then it's incorporated in, in the analysis. But if they are just like some future plans, uh, then we did not consider them. Okay, thank you. Very clear. And we have one question from Pudon. Given the potential of CCS in asset stranding and given the high cost of CCS technologies, what could be the policy recommendations? Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. So um, I think from what we show in our um, results, um, it's true that CCS, um, even it's fully deployed, it has limited impact on reducing the um, the current existing fossil fuel power plants stranding risk. Um, but we do see that um, if CCS are not um, deployed, then the, the stranding risk of the current fossil fuel power, power plants are even much more, 68% um, more. So I would say the policy recommendation is um, we should strongly, uh, we should still um, try to push the development of CCS. Um, as if without CCS, then the, um, there would be much more stranding risk. Uh, but we should also know that even if CCS is fully deployed, um, fully deployed, the impact is, um, is still limited. So that's why 
on the pipeline stand um, power plant side, then what we could do is try to stop the construction or like no commission of any new power plants to try to minimize the risk. Okay, I will have lots of questions for you. Maybe you can discuss it further. Uh, we now have to go for the next presentation. So, Raúl Bajo Buen Estado, are you ready? Hi, Lucas. Hi. So, Good morning, everyone. So today I'm going, to, I'm going to present this paper on market competition and the adoption of clean technology. And I'm going to show you some evidence for the taxi industry. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, this paper. In this paper, first, I want to bring up very old question in the literature, which is the question is, what is the role of the intensity of competition in firms' willingness to innovate and in the diffusion of technology? This is a all, very old question in the literature that dates back, back uh, to the 40s, at least. And there are like two schools in answering this question. The first school is like the Schumpeterian school uh, that argues that monopolies uh, favor uh, innovation. On the other hand, we have the a rolling school uh, that advocates for competition in order to induce innovation and in order to induce diffusion of technology. There are some recent middle ground theories, but um, like the Agion paper at all 2005. My point here is that this question, which is all, is now increasingly important because diffusion of innovation and technology adoption is becoming key in order to fight uh, environmental externalities such as pollution, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and climate change. It is true that countries and policymakers try to regulate, regulate in order to induce firms to adopt green technologies, but we also know that policy measures are often not effective in inducing this uh, technology adoption. Among the major barriers uh, that um, avoid uh, the hinder firms from adopting green technology is precisely one that is commonly cited in the literature is precisely the lack of market competition. Um, so the point is, if there is a lack of market competition and firms are not willing to adopt clean technology, then environmental regulations are not going to become in a, uh, are not going to be effective. However, Someone with a Schumpeterian point of view will say, okay, we need monopolies in order to observe firm adopting green technology. So at the end of the day, this question, which is the first one, the one that I mentioned in the previous slide, it, still there is not a clear cut answer, despite the huge policy implications. And this is the Kind of motivation and and the point is okay so this is an, uh, like an empirical question so what what do, what do we observe in reality so with this background i want i'm going to present now the research question that i address in this paper which is whether an increase in market competition a shock in market competition induces firms to adopt a green technology i'm gonna use this uh, my natural experiment is going to be the rollout of uh, right hailing platforms here i have in mind uber but also another another one on the decisions of taxi drivers to purchase uh, whether whether they purchase green or dirty vehicles after they observe the um, entry of uber and other platforms in the market in order to study this question i'm going to use the universe of vehicles purchased by taxi driver, drive, drivers in Spain between 2014 and 2020. So the context here is, okay, so before the entry of Uber and other platforms, local taxi companies were monopolist in Spain. Uh, and in fact, the takeout of green vehicles among taxi drivers was relatively low. So 
we observe that these platforms, including Uber and Cabify, which is like the Spanish, like locally founded Uber, this is like the, the rival here for, for Uber, these platforms end in the dominant position of the taxi companies. And the question is whether these um, and the entry of these platforms and uh, induce uh, the additional takeout of green vehicles. Empirically, I'm going to use a diff in diff strategy in, gonna, in which I'm going to have three metropolitan areas, those in which Uber and Cabify enter versus control metropolitan areas, which are those in which these platforms did not enter. I'm going to have many robustness checks. And the main results, a very quick overview of the results, is that in those cities or metropolitan areas in which Uber or Cabify enter, we observe that taxi drivers are about 25 to 30% more likely to purchase green vehicles. And I'm going to argue that I find the opposite effect in those cities in which Uber or Cabify are very unlikely to enter. So in those firms, uh, sorry, in those cities, taxi drivers expect not to have competition. And we observe that actually the takeout of dirty vehicle increases. And I'm going to motivate this in, in just a, a few minutes. And I think I know for the sake of time, but very quickly, the literature. So this paper fits at the intersection of three different strands of the literature. First, the strand of regarding market structure and green technology. This, so this strand studies whether well, the, the, the relationship between the market structure and the adoption of green technology among, among firms. Uh, it, it is also related to the literature on the effect of competition and innovation and technology diffusion, which is more general. The previous one is like focus on green technology. This one is just on, on innovation in general. And also uh, it's related to this um, new strand of the literature studying the economic impact of uh, digital platforms in, like in the market. A little bit of background here. So, um, it is important to say that the taxi business is uh, heavily regulated in Spain, and this regulation takes place at the munis municipal level. So among the commonly observed regulatory measures um, that we observe at the municipal level in Spain, this includes uh, a cap in the number of taxis that are operated by taxi companies. So this is called like a system of licenses. So let's say in a city there are 100 licenses, so the there cannot be more than 100 taxi drivers. Um, taxi drivers can only pick up customers inside the metropolitan area. The first, which is like the prices and the working hours are heavily regulated also and are common for all taxi drivers within a, a given metropolitan area. And for instance, taxi uh, the, the vehicles are usually painted white here in Spain. So you can easily identify a taxi vehicle. These, all these regulatory measures create huge barriers in the industry. So effectively, taxi companies are monopolists at the local level in Spain. It's important to say that taxi, taxi drivers are mo mostly self-employed, which means that they choose the vehicle in which or with which they operate in the market. In order to buy, in order to purchase a vehicle, a taxi drivers a taxi driver takes into account not only the upfront payment of the vehicle, but also the per mile cost of the vehicle. As I said, there are two uh, platforms that enter different metropolitan areas in Spain. The first one is Uber, which is very well known. It's uh, based in San Francisco. It's a multinational digital platform. And the other one is Cabify, which is, as I said, locally founded and is like the Spanish Uber. So here it's important to say that Uber was uh, first launched in Barcelona, Madrid, and Valencia back in 2014. And then after a few months, Uber was banned. And then it was relaunched as a professional driver's company. And with uh, actually, well, I explained the regulation of Uber later on, but what, they did, what the regulator did in Spain is they put a cap on the number of uh, Uber, on the number of vehicles Uber uh, can operate at the local level. 
And then following, following this relaunching of the company in Spain, Uber entered different metropolitan areas between uh, 2018 and 2019. Cabify, on the other hand, was founded a little bit early in 2011 as a luxury um, ride hailing app with professional drivers. Um, originally, here is, is, it is explained, it was a, like a luxury service, but then <clears throat> it was relaunched as, as a budget-friendly service called Cabify Lite. And Cabify Lite, which is essentially Uber, is in the same, the, the app is very similar and the, all the features are exactly the same. Uh, this Cabify Lite was uh, then launched in seven, uh, sorry, in five other metropolitan uh, areas. So this is the map of the cities I consider in my study. Here with crosses, you have like the control metropolitan areas where you did not, uh, where uh, Uber and Cabify did not enter. And then here we have some cities where Uber or Cabify enter. So in my baseline, I'm gonna take out Madrid, Valencia and Barcelona for two main reasons. First, because in these three cities, Uber entered like in 2014, as I said before. So these three cities are contaminated, let's say in my sample. And also, it's important to say that Madrid, Valencia, and Barcelona implemented huge uh, low emission zones. Okay, so these are the, the only three cities with relatively heavy low emission zones. So there is another factor here affecting the decision of taxi drivers. I need to say that if I include uh, these three cities, these three metropolitan areas, my estimates do not change substantially. And I have this as a robustness check in my paper. If this is important. So after Uber and Cabify Lite entered the market, then the regulator like put several measures into policy measures into place. What is important here is to say that um, the regulator imposed a cap on the number of vehicles that these companies can operate. And the general rule is that uh, they were allowed to operate one vehicle per um, in every 30 taxis. Okay, so importantly, this upper limit uh, is either binding uh, or sometimes even exceeded uh, in the cities where they operate. So let's say, so let's say here, uh, I don't know, let's pick uh, Madrid. So let's say they are allowed to operate 1,000, Uber is allowed to operate 1,000 cars, then Uber deploys 1,000 cars. So let's say here Alicante, suppose that uh, Uber is allowed to operate, or in this case, Cabify is allowed to operate 20 cars, then Uber uh, Cabify deploys the 20 cars. Okay, so they always uh, deploy the maximum numbers of cars they are allowed to operate. My empirical framework is the following. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna estimate these models. Uh, I'm gonna estimate this model in which taxi accounts for the number of vehicles purchased by taxi driver, tra drivers at the metropolitan area, province, state, and month level. And here I'm gonna distinguish between green and dirty vehicles. And I'm gonna have two dummies here representing Uber and Cabify Lite respectively. And then I'm, I'm gonna introduce some con con vector of controls at the metropolitan area. And also I'm gonna have metropolitan area and time fix effects. Importantly, I'm going to estimate this model using Poisson quasi maximum likelihood estimation, and this is because they count nature of this variable. And I'm going to cluster standard errors and, at the province level. Then I'm going to extend this model to check what is the impact in metropolitan areas in which Uber and Cabify did not enter, but in that are located in provinces where Uber and Cabify enter. So in order to explain this better, let me show you the map again. So here I'm gonna pick Murcia. Okay, so this is a province. So Cabify entered this city. And as I said before, suppose uh, Cabify is allowed to operate 30 vehicles, then Cabify deployed 30 vehicles in Murcia. That means that due to this uh, cap at the province level, it is impossible for Cabify to enter this other city. Therefore, therefore, 
taxi drivers in this other city expect not to face competition because Cabify already entered this province and they cannot operate additional um, vehicles. Bearing this background in mind, I'm going to estimate what is the effect of the entry of Cabify, the entry of Uber or Cabify in the same province, but not in that metropolitan area. Okay. Because again, taxi drivers in those metropolitan areas are unlikely to face competition, um, at least in the short, medium run, because of this regulation at the province level. Here I have some identification assumptions, but I don't want to uh, spend much, much more time uh, more time in these technical details. Um, it's important to acknowledge here that there are several papers now criticizing uh, two-way fixed effects, different diff estimators in which the treatment is staggered of, over time, which is precisely this case. And in order to address this concern, I'm gonna in the paper, I also estimate my model using this new, this novel stack diff in diff approach by Sengit et al. QG 2019. And let me move on. Data I'm going to use uh, publicly av available data on the vehicles purchased by taxi drivers in Spain between 2014 and 2020, in, and also I'm going to combine this data with the dummies of Uber and Cabify. Uh, at the metropolitan area in Spain. Additional controls, um, no, sorry, this is, um, well, this is the data on the, the taxi uh, vehicles purchased by taxi drivers. And here, importantly, I'm gonna identify a green vehicle as if, if a vehicle um, is allowed to, to use one of, one of these two stickers. So echo sticker basically identifies hybrid cars and zero sticker identifies uh, electric cars. So whenever I see a taxi driver purchasing a vehicle with either an eco sticker or a zero sticker, I'm gonna say that this vehicle is green. Otherwise it's a dirty one. Additional control variables include the unemployment rate, income per capita at the province uh, level, political party in the metropolitan area and in the state, um, the regional fuel, uh, fuel tax um, rate and also the aggregate number of eco or zero vehicles purchased by households in Spain. And also because tourism is so important in this country, I'm going to control for the number of tourists. Um, in my sample, I include data from all the metropolitan areas with population above uh, 100k. Uh, metropolitan areas are not only the city, but also the surrounding, surrounding municip municipalities. Again, in my main sample, I drop Madrid, Barcelona, and Valencia for the reasons I already mentioned. If I include them, this is not a big deal, um, but I prefer to remove them at least in my baseline example. So in my baseline sample, I have data from 41 metropolitan areas. The empirical results. So the important uh, coefficients are those in the first two rows. Um, columns one to four, I have the impact on green vehicles. And columns five to eight, I have the impact on dirty vehicles. So the, the, the takeaway here is whenever we observe Uber or Cabify light like entering a metropolitan area, the takeout of green vehicle increases a lot among taxi drivers. And we observe slightly some evidence, <coughs> sorry, of the opposite effect for dirty vehicles. Here you have like a kind of event study plot in which you observe this uh, increase, a huge increase for uh, green vehicles whenever Uber or Cabify enters, which is denoted by T here and this, this um, vertical line and that of dirty vehicle decreases a lot. T here denotes uh, quarters, by the way. Finally, the, the effect on the like the in-province effect is just the opposite of the one I documented before. So whenever we observe Uber or Cabify entering in a different metropolitan area within the same province, the takeout of the green vehicles slightly decreases and that of dirty vehicle increases, which is precisely the opposite effect, which is the one that we find 
in cities that are not expected to face competition uh, due to the regulation that I mentioned before. Just to conclude, in this paper, I study whether market, an increase in market competition induces uh, firms to adopt green technology as a natural experiment that uses the one, uh, this one on Uber and Cabify. And my finding is that take out of the green technology, which in, in this case is the green vehicle, increases a lot in cities where there is more competition in the taxi industry. And if you know um, competition is less ex expected, then the take out of the dirty vehicle increases more and that of green vehicles that not increases. And that's it. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, I can see no questions in the chat box. Ah, yes, there is one from Prudence. Did you control for regional or local specific policies like any financial support policy that support green cars? And did you also check the results by using only e-vehicles? Yeah, the, the, those are great questions. Uh, so regarding the second question, um, there are very few um, electric vehicles, actually. So mostly are hybrid, also some natural gas power vehicles. But if I include in my regression only electric vehicles, I have too many zeros. So the coefficients are kind of weird. Regarding the first question, uh, this is very important. So I need to say that most of the regional uh, policies take place at the state level. So at the province level, there are no specific policies. In order to control for that, I include um, state fixed effects and also municipality fixed effects. So this should take that into account. And I also have one specification in which I include a state fixed effect uh, um, with the time fix effect, both combined. So this, this should take that into account. But I need, to, I need to say that there are no huge or relevant policies implemented that are suddenly changing like uh, the market uh, at, the, at the regional level. So no, no, nothing, nothing too, I would say too huge to take into account. Okay. Uh, any question from the audience? No. Okay, so thank you very much, Raul. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to go for the last presentation. Okay, so now you should see my screen. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna give the last presentation of this session 12. My name is Lucas Despor, and I'm a PhD student at Mint Paritech. Uh, and I'm gonna speak about the role of carbon capture, utilization, and storage in the global energy system, with, performed with long-term optimization and decarbonization of the industry. So I'm going to proceed in a very conventional way. Uh, so first depicting the context um, regarding uh, CCUS and the industry, then about the methodology I applied and especially uh, the discipline I use always, as well as the tool, and then the main assumptions, the scenarios and the discussion before presenting you the results and concluding, of course. So the context is really about CCUS. So I'm pretty sure everybody knows here what this uh, set of technologies is, but just as a reminder, carbon capture, utilization, and storage consists in capturing either atmospheric CO2 or uh, fossil-based uh, combustion CO2, or also industry process CO2 emissions in order to avoid this, those emissions to the atmosphere. So once captured, the CO2 is purified and can either be stored in saline aquifers or in depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Um, but it can also be utilized to manufacture fuels, chemicals, building materials, and so on. Um, and one thing important to retain for the rest of the results is that the capture is uh, most of the time partial, meaning that only 90% of the CO2 flue gas is captured. 
And regarding the industry sector, there are many point sources that are uh, eligible to uh, CCUS uh, units. So some of are here. And what is also important in context of energy modeling is the cost of uh, CO2 avoided uh, according to the, um, the industry we are talking about. So for example, we have very uh, cheap industries here in Orange that have high purity sources of CO2 flue gas. So the, the cost, the effort to capture CO2 is very low and the cost is cheap for natural gas processing, hydrogen, urea. Whereas in other more uh, CO2 intensive industries such as iron and steel and cement, we have a cost of avoided CO2 uh, way higher than the others. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, those two industries especially are the most contributing to industrial CO2 emissions worldwide. So this here, there are the industrial CO2 emissions in 2017 by the IEA representing 8.5 gigatons of direct CO2 emitted or 23% of global CO2 emissions. And you can see that cement and iron and steel are the main contributors with chemicals also. Uh, and other uh, industries industries are non-ferrous, pulp and paper, food and tobacco. Um, so they are the most expensive to decarbonize and the most um, emitting one. So we have chosen to focus on those uh, two industries in this study. And uh, the, the other reason is that the chemical sector is really hard to model due to the very complex processes and interactions between them. So here we are only talking on the two most um, CO2 intensive industries. Uh, so let's just get back to the question I just raised, the role of CCUS in the global energy system. So I just uh, explained briefly what CCUS and the industry here is. I now have to explain you what is the tool, so the global energy system, and what is the discipline I utilize in this uh, study. So the prospective discipline is really about exploring the future of a system. So here we're talking about a global energy system. Um, and that is not forecasting. The, the starting point is common, of course, but we, for example, we have the total primary energy supply in 2010. And the forecasting um, discipline will try to know how it will happen, how, why we want to know how it could happen. Uh, according to some uh, constraints and pol climate policies. So to do so, to explore the future, we apply an optimal paradigm, which consists in minimizing the total annual cost of every future year. Um, and uh, this is achieved through investment decisions under several constraints and policies. So typically these decisions are um, the, the investment into um, assets um, in technologies. Um, the model I use with, within the, the prospective discipline is called the TIAM FR model, which is part of the Times family model. So uh, the Times model generator combines two different systemat systematic approaches to modeling energy, which is a technical engineering approach and an economic uh, approach uh, accounting for CO2, uh, for prices and cost. Uh, time is a technology rich bottom up model, model generator describing energy and material flows um, from the extraction of um, primary resources to the supply of the demands. Uh, it performs a partial equilibrium meaning that they only represent the energy sector of the economy, so do not consider interaction with other sectors of the economy, and um, also do not, does not consider um, um, feedbacks from the consumer parts, so for example, the prices or the demands. And this equilibrium is, find, is found by minimizing the net present value of the total system, which is equal over regions and over period to the discounted cost of uh, annual cost for a region and a period itself equals to uh, the set of uh, decisions variable x that are chosen by the model that are subject to climate, economic, and technical constraints. So let's get some hate. Here is really the model I use. So this is the regional disaggregation with uh, big uh, region aggregated such as Africa and South uh, America. 
And we model the exchanges between regions in terms of fossil fuels, uh, biomass, uh, steel also. Uh, the model is based in year 2010, and we apply perfect foresight of agents until the end of the century, meaning that the demands are exogenous and are driven by the forecast from the, um, from the um, UN in terms of GDP and population. Uh, so we know every year what the demands uh, has to be. Um, another way to appreciate this model is to um, talk in terms of reference energy system. So depicting the, um, the flows uh, within the, 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 the model, starting from the fossil fuel resources, biomass potential, renewables and nuclear that are transformed either into liquids uh, or gaseous fuels and um, or in electricity, heat, and hydrogen to supply the five sectors of the model that are transport sector, residential, commercial, agriculture, and industry. The industry sector is split into uh, six subsectors that are the iron and steel, non-ferrous, cement, pulp and paper, chemicals, and the other uh, industries. And we apply, uh, we model on this um, framework the um, the capture or the carbon of cap the car sorry the carbon capture on the industry sector, the electricity uh, generation sector and the hydrogen sector. Once captured, the, the carbon can either be sequestered into geologic formations, or converted into fuels with the reaction uh, in with the hydrogen. A uh, very big strength of the model is that it can account for every uh, GAG emissions that are stemming from the activity of this global energy system. And this is, is important because it can calculate at the end the change in temperature at, uh, in the atmosphere, considering that there are interaction with the oceans and with other radiative uh, force forcing agents. So it's very practical, for example, if we want to uh, set uh, climate constraints of uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees, for example. Uh, the main assumptions I took in this study for the iron and steel sector are um, the cost of avoided CO2 that are coming from the ETSAP, with three main technologies uh, incorporating carbon capture that are uh, here. And so the cost of um, CO2 avoided um, range from uh, 60 to 75 dollars per ton of CO2. This is not including CO2 transport and storage. And uh, uh, we uh, also model other mitigation strategies for this sector that are biomass burning, top gas recycling, improving the efficiency, electric arc furnace routes from scrap melting, smelting and the direct reduction of iron or DRI through electricity or hydrogen. For the cement sector, we took our assumptions from the European Cement Research Academy and the Usable Energy Database. And those are the costs of avoided CO2 in, in this sector. So we can show, we show some very optimistic and uh, cheap uh, CO2 avoidance costs with oxy fuel technology in this sector while post-combustion uh, options are more expensive. But again, this does not include uh, CO2 transport and storage. And uh, other mitigation strategies are fewer in this sector um, because we, have, we only implemented uh, biomass burning, but this does not um, offset the process CO2 emissions of clinical decalcination. But we also model the, the uh, other uh, technologies that mix the clinker into cement and that, that are less clinker intensive at the end. For CO2 utilization, we only model on site production of syn fuels. So this uh, avoids to uh, pay for the CO2 transport and distribution. So the CO2 is directly after capture. Um, reacting with uh, hydrogen that is either uh, produced on well, imported or pro produced on site through electricity uh, through electrolysis and to produce e-fuels or seen fuels that are methanol, diesel and gasoline. Uh, and we also account for uh, residual CO2 emissions. 
Uh, in terms of CO2 transport and storage, we have uh, assumed the potential of um, superior to 10,000 gigatons of CO2 from this reference. And we, uh, so we have many uh, options. So, and hence all recovery, saline aquifer, onshore and offshore, as well as depleted oil and gas fields. And then uh, for the cost of CO2 transport and storage, we have a very optimistic uh, main scenario of $10 per ton of CO2. But as you will see at the end of this presentation, there we apply a sensitivity analysis with cost ranging from $20 to $50 per ton of CO2 worldwide. The scenarios I'm discussing here are the one is first in line with the Paris Agreement, so consistent with the temperature elevation of 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So uh, this uh, scenario involves a decarbonation of the world energy system roughly in 2050. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the industry is uh, completely decarbonized because we can rely on negative emissions through BEGS and DAC. Um, there is, an, so that's why I wanted to model another scenario that is the industry decarbonation by 80% in 2050. The, so this scenario is called in the 80. Um, first, why did I chose, uh, choose the 80% ratio is because industry is really hard to decarbonize because of the process emission first. And uh, second, because even if we apply a carbon capture on this uh, on, on industrial assets, as I said before, there is a partial capture, which means that we cannot uh, totally uh, decarbonize industry as as the model is um, is, uh, is is represented right now. So anyway, if we if we would have model uh, industry decarbonization by one hundred percent. It would have been uh, unfeasible. So we chose this ratio, um, and this ratio is um, decarbonation, decarbonation ratio is compared to 2010 levels. And other information, important information, is that it only includes direct CO2 emissions and not indirect emissions. So you will see this has an impact on um, the results, and we also account for uh, process emissions. So the results for the steel industry are the following. Uh, here we have the global crude steel production routes over the 21st century constrained into the Paris Agreement scenario, and here the in 80 scenario. So first, was, what we can say is that uh, there is a strong competition between the CCS route and the hydrogen route here in green. So in the Paris Agreement, uh, CCS is deployed widely in the uh, early uh, 2030s uh, and then leave some space to the hydrogen uh, routes, um, while uh, always a substantial part of uh, the, the crude is obtained through, um, so through scrap smelting and recycling. And it's interesting to see that when we constrain the, the, the industry to 80% decarbonation, we do not rely as much as before on CCS, but rather on uh, hydrogen uh, routes. And this is mainly because um, we, there is no direct emissions through the hydrogen routes. Um, other, um, big uh, constraint that might not be realistic is that uh, existing assets are totally phased out by 2030. We have the same uh, information for the cement industry. So you can be very appalled of, of the huge expansion of the global cement production over the 21st century, but this is uh, highly due to China's, India's, and Africa's appetite, uh, which uh, GDP and population are exploding in the 21st century. Um, so the models uh, rely on a total phase out of existing assets and totally replaced by dry kin with oxy combustion capture. Um, but it also relies on um, the, the the share in clinker of clinker in cement that is um, now in in traditional cement so Portland cement. This is ninety five percent of clinker. And in this other scenario, the share is reduced. So here you have in beige, uh, the share that is reduced and, for, and that leaves some space to uh, less clinker intensive cements. 
In terms of CO2 capture, we have here the two scenarios for the different sectors. So CO2 combustion in the industry, CO2 combustion from power sector, negative emissions and process CO2 emissions from the industry. And you can see that less CO2 is captured uh, from the industry in the, in the AT scenario, but um, more CO2 is captured from the um, power sector. So this uh, is very consistent with what we can observe in the other uh, sectors of the, of the industry. That is, uh, the industry is electrified to uh, avoid direct emissions. So, and, and it relies um, hence on a, a deep decarbonation of the electric sector that is uh, achieved in help with uh, more uh, CO2 capture. Uh, and because we also have more, um, CO2 uh, capture rate uh, of 90% per percent in this sector. Um, the model uh, really prefers storage and utilization, which is uh, normal uh, because uh, the utilization options are fuel, so cannot really um, offset or reduce um, CO2 emissions at the end. Um, but 93% of the CO2 utilized comes from industrial assets, and this is because the cheapest CO2 that can be captured in the model comes from oxyfuel combustion in cement plants. CCU for what? This is mainly for producing gasoline and methanol. Uh, so this is the global production over the 21st century, and we have here um, the share of uh, production routes, uh, and you can see that CO2 utilization is highly um, representing the global share of uh, methanol production uh, over the 21st century and more than 50% for gasoline. Uh, and uh, finally, the sensitivity analysis uh, shows that the, trans the cost of CO2 tran transport and storage has a very small impact on the amount of CO2 that is to be utilized. So here we have the increase of CO2 transport and storage, and you can see that there is a very, very uh, low uh, increase uh, of the cumulative amount of CO2 that is utilized in the model. So to conclude, CCS faces strong competition with hydrogen in the steel industry due to partial CO2 capture. But, and CCS is essential on the contrary in cement plants, but can also benefit from less clean care intensive cement production. While the CCU route has a minor future compared to the CCS one, but can significantly help in producing clean fuels in terms of production shares. And I think the most important information of this study is that an AT decarbonization of the industry does not necessarily implies more CO2 capture units, but rather, rather more expensive clean production routes to avoid for, for um, uh, direct CO2 emissions. And uh, I think that an AT decarbonation policy is not uh, necessarily desirable, nor feasible technically by the model, because first, the total annual cost of industry is twice higher than the, the one in the Paris Agreement. And this is because the model can afford for cheaper negative emissions in the Paris Agreement scenario. Thank you for your attention. Do you have questions? Okay, so I have one question from Florence. So regarding the cost of avoided CO2, did you consider uniform cost for all the region or specific to each region? Is your model capable of integrating additional costs for renewable electricity like backup capacities to manage intermittency? So first question, yes, we use the regional disaggregation to apply uh, various um, vary, varying costs of uh, CO2 that is um, uh, referenced by a paper uh, from, uh, that I can send you the reference, which is uh, accounting for uh, the efficiency cost, um, variable cost and capital um, cost of CCS plants due to uh, location. So yes, we have uh, this information in the model. So the, I, I did not show the result, but the, the, the assumptions, but yes, there is a variation in China and um, Middle East are the cheapest uh, regions, while Europe, as you imagine, um, is the most expensive. And for the second question, uh, we, um, 
yeah, it's difficult uh, to integrate additional costs for renewable electricity, like backup capacities. So what's a basic uh, assumption we have is that the intermittent um, renewable electricity can only uh, represent 50% of the total uh, electricity produced. And a second question from YangCU. Um, Oh, sorry. So seems your results on Siemens CCS is the only solution, unlike Posteer, which could use hydrogen. Just curious, why is this the case due to industrial process? Uh, uh, you, you're meaning for the steel industry? I think, yes. Uh, well, hydrogen roots in the... In the, in the in the steel industry uh, does not emit any uh, direct CO2 emissions. So uh, the model prefers to use that, uh, whereas uh, it is uh, most uh, more expensive than CCS um, routes. So that's why I think that that's why that's the reason why it chooses um, this industrial process. And have you compared the cost of CCS in other solutions, negative emissions? to industries, uh, yes, yeah, actually, yes, we have. So we have four uh, processes that model the negative emissions of, uh, of uh, with bioenergy and CCS. We have a cost of avoided CO2 uh, around $130 per ton of CO2, also varying across regions. Um, but I cannot tell more. I, I think I, I think we would be worth to go deeper. 